Hear now the word of the Lord. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had made the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Um, We are now currently less than three weeks away from my favorite holiday of the whole year, from Thanksgiving. Um, Thanksgiving for me is filled with a lot of very special memories, especially about uh, family and especially some of the the times I got to spend with my grandparents before they passed away. Um, I love the whole menu of Thanksgiving. I could eat it all year round, um, um, but wisely probably limit it to one day a year. Um, And just really good fellowship, uh, really good conversations. I think about a lot of times I've spent playing games over those times. Um, A lot of really wonderful memories associated for me with Thanksgiving, and so I, I just absolutely love it. But Thanksgiving is a holiday that I think more than most requires a significant amount of of preparation. Now, practically, a lot of that preparation centers on preparing all of the food. Uh, There's a lot of planning, a lot of preparation. Um, In my family, there's there's a sort of a schedule of when the oven is going to be in use on the day of and planning it. Now, I I am not a a great cook. I do not enter much into that. It would spoil the holiday in many ways if I were cooking too much of this food. However, I do have every year a cranberry jello salad that's been in my family for six generations, including my children. And uh, while not everyone loves it, some do, and so I make it because I love it especially. So it's a time of preparing food, a lot of practical preparations in that way. But it's also kind of a special time nearly at the end of the year. It's, it's not the time where you start looking forward so much, where you start planning your New Year's resolutions and things like that. But at the end of the year, it's, it's, it's a special time to really think back on what blessings the Lord has given over this past year. I mean, indeed, the, the timing of Thanksgiving was historically calculated to, to fall right after harvest time, to remember the great abundance that, that God had, had given to his people. Once again, God provided food for his people to eat and to celebrate that and to take time to give thanks for that. It's not just about stuffing your face. It is really about a preparation of your heart, a personal preparation, a a preparation of the posture of your attitude and disposition about life and particularly toward the Lord and the blessings that he has given to us. You do make a lot of food, but you also need to reflect on the Lord's goodness toward you. Now, here in Jesus' teaching... He is teaching us how to prepare, practically speaking, and also to prepare our hearts, particularly to make these preparations in light of his coming. One day Jesus is going to return, and and so far in the passages that have led up to this passage, Jesus has been 
advancing the idea that we must be prepared, that we must be ready. But he has not yet really told us how. We must be ready. In the parable of the, the, the ten virgins in the last passage, you know, some virgins were wise and had oil. Others were foolish and did not have oil when it came time. The foolish virgins were not prepared. But, but what exactly does that mean? How do we go about this process of preparation? Well, Jesus is going to teach us exactly what this preparation looks like in, the, in this passage and in the next passage that we will read when we get to it. Our big idea then today is this, that we are to prepare for Christ's coming by fruitful labor and faithful love. Prepare for Christ's coming by fruitful labor. That's the practical preparations, kind of like preparing the food of Thanksgiving. And also faithful love. That has to do more with the posture of our hearts, our attitudes, our dispositions, particularly our faithfulness and love toward fellow believers. So two parts, uh, fruitful labor first, and second, faithful love. Uh, fruitful labor we are going to look at first as we consider this parable of the talents in verses 14 through 30. Now, again, to catch us up, uh, remember back in verse 36, Jesus said that we would not know the day or the hour of his return. Not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only knows it. Then in verse 24, verse 44, Jesus says, Therefore, you also must be ready... For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And then in 25 verse 13, just the, the previous verse before our passage today, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So again, all of these exhortations, be ready, be ready, be ready. You don't know when it's coming. Make the proper preparations before the time. But what exactly does that mean? And so to explain what this means, Jesus says four. Whenever you see four, you have to kind of see what it's explaining. It's explaining. In other words, this is what I'm trying to tell you, Jesus says. For it will be like, the day of his return will be like, and then he tells a story about a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. And he gave to one five talents, to another two talents, and to another one, each according to his ability, and then he went away. Okay? So as... Jesus starts talking about what it will be like for his eventual return. He tells a story that begins with a man who is leaving. And this, of course, is representative of him. Just as Christ has gone on a long journey, not into another land, but into heaven itself where he is reigning there. In the meantime, until his return, he has entrusted a stewardship to his people, a stewardship to his servants. Well, what then do these talents that Jesus talks about represent? Well, to begin, we have to understand that a talent, um, don't think about it in terms of like someone might be talented in sports and another person might be talented in music, although to some degree there is a symbolic representation, but that's not what they mean in this passage here. The idea of a talent was simply of a, a weight of measurement, okay? It was like, like a pound, but it was bigger than a pound. And what Jesus was saying is this master was entrusting to his servants a, a large measure, particularly of a precious metal. So there was so much money, you had to weigh it out as you entrusted it to his servants. And one talent, depending on exactly what the metal is, we're not told what precious metal, whether there's a silver or bronze or gold or something else, but one talent would likely mean more than a lifetime of earnings for a worker. So uh, just one talent was an incredible amount of money. The one who was entrusted with five talents, this is a staggering amount of money that this master just entrusted to his servants telling them to make use of it while he is gone. Now, what then do these talents symbolize? Well, they symbolize really numerous aspects of the stewardship that we have been entrusted in our life. First, and we're really going to see this in the way this works itself out, but first and foremost, Jesus is talking about the stewardship that has been entrusted to us of the gospel itself, that we have been entrusted with the message, the gospel proclamation that Christ has come and that Christ has died and he has risen from the dead and that one day he will return again. And we have a stewardship to share this and to encourage one another with it, but also to spread this around, to tell our family, our friends, our neighbors, some even being sent to the far corners of the earth to proclaim this message to those who have not yet heard. We have a stewardship of the gospel. But then you think about other relationships and things that we've been entrusted with. So think about our families. Each of us have been entrusted with a stewardship of a, a relationship to our families that no one else has that same relationship to each of our families. 
And then maybe more broadly speaking, you might consider all the ways in which we are called to seek good in a sinful, evil, broken, and fallen world. Think particularly the vocations to which you've been called. The work that you do during the week, working for a company, working in your home, working in a variety of ways, you are seeking to do good in this world. Not lasting good, not transformative good. We aren't fixing this world. We aren't transforming this world or redeeming this world. That is impossible. Christ alone can do that kind of a work, and he will only do it once he returns and sets everything right. But yet we are called to serve our fellow believers and and our fellow man in this world. There's a stewardship that we are called and entrusted with, and, and Christ takes those kinds of things seriously. And notice then that of the talents, of the resources and relationships that would have been entrusted to us, we've all been given different amounts, symbolized by someone who having five talents, some, uh, someone else who has two talents, and someone who has one talent. Now what this is getting at, and we're going to see this borne out, is that God knows that he has entrusted differing amounts to us, differing relationships, different resources, and we will be judged accordingly. We will not be judged according to what someone else has been entrusted, but to what God has entrusted to each one of us. However, all of us alike, even though we've been entrusted with differing levels of resources and relationships, all of us alike are required to be faithful with whatever has been entrusted to us. And so you see this symbolized immediately in the actions of those who have been entrusted both five talents and two talents. Each of these servants rush out and immediately they begin investing these differing amounts of, of investment, these five talents and two talents, and they're, they're trading and bartering and building businesses. They're trying to build something that will bring a return to steward their master's property well so that when the master returns, they will have a return. And indeed, both of them double the amount that the master has entrusted them. There's a, there's a 100% return on investment. The one who has five talents gains five more. The one who has two talents gains two more. But their work is very different in verse 18 from the one who has been entrusted one talent. This man does not go out to, to do anything with the talent, but to bury it. He doesn't waste it. He just does nothing with it. Now, as we think about the previous passage and compare it to the parable of the ten virgins, we might understand that the the, the one who's been entrusted five talents and the one who's been entrusted two talents, uh, these are like the wise virgins, those who came with oil, that when they got late and the, the bridegroom was long delayed and they fell asleep, well, that was okay because when the bridegroom came, they were ready. Their oil was ready. They were ready to go out to meet the bridegroom. But the one who had done nothing with his talent was not ready when the master would eventually return, like the foolish virgins who did not bring oil. So when the bridegroom arrived, they had to go and buy it, and when they were able to buy it, and the time came for them to finally arrive at the party, it was too late, and they were shut out of it. And the Lord of the the bridegroom said, I never knew you. We also think about the way that this uh, one was gone for a long time, that he was gone on a long journey. After a long time, he returned, and it was a very long time. And and we think about how the bridegroom was delayed. There's a lot of parallels between these two talents. But after this long time, in verse 19, when the master arrived, then he called his servants and settled accounts with them. And the one who had been entrusted five talents and the one who had been entrusted two talents, like the wise virgins, are ready to present their earnings. Now, it's fascinating as we look at the master's response It's the same to both of them. And and, and there is an inequality in what they return because the one who had been entrusted five has five to present to their master, five more. And the one who had been entrusted two has only two to present more. But the master recognizes that even though they have unequal returns, the rate of return was the same for both. Both of them had been very, very diligent and faithful. They were entrusted with unequal amounts and yet they had an equal return in terms of the rate of their return, 100% returns. And the master is so proud of them. There's three parts to his response. He, he praises them. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. And second, he promises to each of them an accelerated responsibility. He says, you have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. So there's a promotion to greater responsibility. But then third... There's just this precious promise. He says, enter into the joy of your master. Now, the first two of these items make a lot of sense. 
In any kind of workplace environment, anytime a servant or a worker has done a good job, there's going to be praise or there should be praise and there should be a promotion to a greater responsibility. All right, you've been faithful here. Let's, let's see if you can handle a little bit more. But the third one is striking. It's the master no longer treating these servants as economic property. They're not just his slaves, economic resources to make him money. He's really inviting them into his household. Enter into the joy of your master. The master is receiving the dividends of his investment and he's inviting his servants into his home, into his household to enter into the joy of the master. He's not treating them as employees. He's treating them as family members. Now again, the same response is by the, those who have been entrusted five and those who have been entrusted two unequal talents but, but, and, and an unequal amount of return but an equal rate of return. What we are seeing here is that God is pleased to entrust to you what he entrusts to you and he is seeking from you faithfulness. Faithfulness to seek fruitful labor, to make practical preparations, to be faithful in what you've been entrusted, to put it to good use, to have a return to show your master when he comes again. But in verses 24 through 30, we see the flip side of this. Well, we see the one who has entrusted one talent and who simply buried that talent in the ground he has no return on his investment to show. And instead of bringing a return, Master, you entrusted me one talent, and see, I've made you another talent, or I've made you a half talent, or a quarter talent, or any kind of return. The only thing this servant can bring is the single talent that he, was, that he dug up to bring back to his master, and then accusations. He accused him, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. It's unclear if the servant thinks that this is going to pass muster. It's unclear if he thinks that this is going to fly. Maybe the master will, will think, well, maybe, ooh, maybe I am a little harsh, and maybe this is hard, and... Oh, this poor guy, maybe I should cut him some slack here. But the master sees through what this servant has said as an utter lie. He's saying one thing, namely he was afraid. He was afraid of the fact that the master would seek a return even where the master had not himself invested. But the master had invested in this servant. So very much the master would be seeking a return from this servant. So the servant did something that was utterly illogical. Rather than seeking any investment, rather than investing this even in the banks where there would be interest to return to the master, this servant does nothing. It's not that he didn't do enough. It is that he did nothing. He buried this talent in the ground. And so the master rebukes this servant. He says, you wicked and slothful servant. At the end of the day, that's the issue. He's wicked in his attitude toward his master, and he is lazy, slothful, unwilling to do anything toward advancing what the master had entrusted to him. And he says, you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. Even a little would have been enough. But you gave nothing. And so, in verse 28, the master says, take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents... For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what we has will be taken away. In other words, again, it's not a matter of doing enough to please God. What Jesus is saying is for those who are faithful in their preparations for the Master, whatever you have... God will so much more graciously, abundantly reward you beyond your wildest dreams. To have a little bit, God will reward you far beyond what you deserve because all of this reward comes by grace. But if you do nothing, not just if you do not enough, but if you do nothing, then even what has been entrusted to you will be taken away from you so that you will no longer possess even that. The terrifying moment is in verse 30 where he says, Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like the foolish virgins who are told, I say to you, I do not know you, and who are locked out from entering into the kingdom, the first two servants are admitted into the joy of the master. 
while this servant is cast out in the outer darkness where he is literally tortured, weeping and gnashing of teeth because of his exclusion from the master's joy. So what we are seeing here is a very clear application where Jesus is calling us. Do you want to know how to prepare? Prepare, first of all, for Christ's coming by pursuing fruitful labor. Make practical preparations. Again, just like for the Thanksgiving dinner, you're going to make practical preparations to make sure you have all the ingredients. Some of them are strange. How often do you have nutmeg? Or how often do you have cranberries on hand? Well, maybe not always. But for Thanksgiving, you want to have those things. To have the normal Thanksgiving things, you have to make the practical preparations. And then actually make the food so that the feast is ready in time. Here, Jesus says, the readiness that is required of us is the pursuit of fruitful labor where we take what God has entrusted to us and we steward it for His glory. You see, in your life, you have been entrusted with so many assets. Some of these are talents in the sense of giftedness to be good at one thing or another. But again, I want you to think about the areas of your life that God has actually entrusted to you. Think about the fact that you are a steward of your family. Now, your family may not be the highest on your list, or maybe your family is a source of great joy. Regardless, understand that no one else can invest in your family, can steward your family in the way that you can. None of the rest of us have a relationship with your family that you have because you are a member of your family. Now, children, I want to speak especially to you. Sometimes children, you don't think you can contribute all that much. Maybe you're not old enough to help to make some of the food, or maybe you just haven't been trained. Maybe you have more talent in that area than I do, and maybe someday you will. Maybe even you can do a little bit this time. But I want, to think about all, I want you to think about all the things, children, that you can do. Do you realize no one else can help your parents like you do? Even if there are people who are capable of doing other things, no one else is actually there with your parents to come alongside and, and help your parents. No one else can serve your siblings the way you can, even when maybe they're not being totally nice to you. No one else can clean up messes in your home. No one else can show kindness to others in your home, especially when people who live in your home are hurting. No one else can help to get work done. Again, other people outside your house could do that work, but they're not there. They don't live there. You alone have an opportunity to steward those opportunities to serve, to use your abilities and your time and your energy to serve your parents and your, and your siblings. And parents, likewise, you alone have a responsibility to steward the raising of your children. We had a baptism here earlier this morning, and remember the three questions that were asked to the parents about particularly the, the role and the obligations that parents have concerning children. But then the church was asked to answer question two, but there it's a secondary role. Do you promise to assist, assist the parents in the raising and the nurture of this child? And we can promise to assist, but you parents have a unique role. Steward that time, steward those energy and the resources you have well, whether that's the catechism booklet that Andrew mentioned or, or the Word of God or stewarding your prayers with and for your children. Well, what about this church? You have been entrusted a church. No one outside this church can invest in this church the way that you can. And that's more than just if you're staff in some way. Everyone has tremendous opportunities uh, to serve in various ways. Now, there are many believers in this city who are wonderful people with whom we will fellowship for all of eternity. But Christ has actually established a body here. Christ has actually given gifts, given people and energy and resources and relationships for you to steward here. No one outside this church can steward this church the way that you can. What about your neighbors, your coworkers, your extended family? Again, no one else shares your relationships. No one else will be at the Thanksgiving dinner that you will be a part of. No one else lives where you live to be able to simply cross the street to help the neighbor clean up after a storm like the one we had a few months ago. This kindness reflects the love of God and God uses those things by His Spirit to lead others toward faith in Christ. I'll even give you an idea. Uh, no one else can invite the people you know to some of the events and activities that are coming up in the church. 
Think about the fair trade market. Think about the Christmas concert on December 15th and the Christmas Eve service. People are looking for ways to uh, connect in ways like that. People are looking for a church that that will love people and will show uh, mercy to those outside the church. There's an opportunity for you to meet those you know to invite them in a way that none of us shares the relationships that you have to have that kind of access to those people. And then finally, a steward of your time, your talents, and your treasures. The talents here certainly symbolize more than that, but they certainly symbolize those things. No one else can manage the resources that God has entrusted to you. Others, your pastors, friends, your family members can help you to potentially build a plan, but only you can execute that plan to steward what has been entrusted to you. Will you bury what God has entrusted to you, or will you use what God has entrusted to you to build bridges, to serve other people, to meet needs, all for the sake of Christ? Now, we don't build the kingdom. Christ alone is the one who builds his kingdom. Rather, Christ has called us to plant and to water, to be faithful in doing these things as we wait expectantly for God alone to give the growth. On the last day, the main question here is this, that when Christ returns, will you be ready to report on your return on investment? And indeed, if you've been investing in ways that maybe you haven't seen, will you be prepared for God to show you how far that investment has gone in ways that you are unaware of in this life? Well, if this is the kind of fruitful labor that we should be practically preparing ourselves for Christ's return... What does that mean specifically? How do we prioritize? What do we prioritize to prepare? Well, in this next section, Christ is calling us to a particular attitude, a posture, personal preparation, particularly in the area of faithful love. Certainly, this will have practical implications, but what Christ gets at in the next section really concerns the fundamental posture of our hearts. Again, just like at Thanksgiving, it's not just about gobbling down turkey. It's about thankfulness, gratitude, recognizing the blessings that God has given you. So here there's a a fundamental disposition that Christ calls us to in this second section. So let's look at this second section in verses 31 through 46, faithful love. And I will read this as we begin our study of it. Verse 31, chapter 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you also did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now in this passage... One commentator, Noland, points out that there's a deep similarity between verses 31 and 32 and what we saw in the previous chapter in verses 30 and 31. Uh, look back at Matthew chapter 30, 24, verses 30 through 31. 
Then Jesus says, will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, or then will appear in heaven, or the Son of Man who is in heaven, the sign. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, a couple weeks ago, I argued that this is not talking about Christ's final return. You can listen to that sermon uh, where I argue that. But rather, this is about the coming of the Son of Man, the enthroning of the Son of Man, the exaltation of the Son of Man, where he is uh, ascended into heaven and is seated and enthroned at the right hand of his Father. And from there, he sends out his ministers, his angels, symbolically leading forth the gospel as though with the blast of a trumpet where they're gathering together his people from the four winds, from the four corners of the earth. Well, now look at the similarity here in chapter 25, verses 31 and 32. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. This is about the final return, the final coming of the Son of Man. And all the angels with him. No longer are the angels sent to the four winds. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all nations. Again, no longer will all the nations be gathered with a trumpet by these angels, but now they will actually be brought before the Lord. And this will include his elect as well as those who have not trusted in Christ. Before him he will, will, be, will be gathered all the nations and he's going to separate them. One from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, if you read the commentaries, they explain that in those days, the uh, shepherds would often have oversight over sheep and goats as well. And together during the day, they would have all of these animals together, and they would go out and they would graze in the same places. But at night, you would separate them. Why? Well, because the goats have that thin, you know, coarse fur, and sheep have that woolly um, coat. And so the sheep can stay warm a little bit better than the goats. The goats, you have to actually herd together for warmth at night. And as D.A. Carson says, from that well-known shepherding detail, Jesus now freights it, lays it up with symbolism. Because again, to separate the sheep to his right, the, the right side is the side of power and honor. Think about what it means that the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is, is now seated at the right hand of his Father. Where is he? He's in the place of power and honor at his Father's right hand. And in verse 34 through 40, the language of the Son of Man, where this begins, shifts over to the language of a king. Verse 34, then the king, same thing as the Son of Man. The Son of Man in Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14, is, is given a dominion and a kingdom and a rule and authority. And this king, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, says to the righteous, invites them in to inherit the kingdom. He's just like in the last par parable where he said, enter into the joy of your master. Now in this passage, Jesus is saying, enter into the kingdom. Why? Well, the king explains, because you served me in my need. And he lists all of these examples of the need that the king had and the way that the people, these righteous sheep, served his master's needs. Now what's so interesting is the righteous are unaware of how they had served the king. They're not thinking about their works Many look at this passage and say, you better be doing the right things and lay up for yourself enough good works because only then on the last day will you be admitted into the kingdom of heaven. But that is not what Jesus is saying here. The righteous are totally oblivious of the works that they have done. When did we see you in these difficulties, these dire straits, these needs, and then meet these needs in various ways? They're not thinking about practical preparations. Rather intuitively, because of a transformation of their heart, they did serve the king, but they did so by serving the least of these my brothers, Jesus says. Now, who are the least of these my brothers? The least of these my brothers. Not just the least of these, but the least of these my brothers in verse 40. Well, he's not talking about all the poor everywhere, as good as that is to serve the poor in whatever capacity we can. He's particularly talking about believers who have been brought into various kinds of suffering from various causes, whether from persecution or from sickness or from um, uh, famine or whatever, whatever kinds of needs to meet the needs of fellow believers. That's what these righteous are recognized for doing. And what Jesus says is the king, he, on that last day, will recognize those acts as personal acts of service to him. Now, there's another passage where we see the flip side of this. 
is in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, when the one who was formerly called Saul and then his name was changed to Paul after his conversion, Jesus confronted him on the road when Saul was on the way to Damascus to persecute other Christians. And Jesus says, as as Saul is going to go put these Christians to death and haul them into prison, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The suffering that we afflict on the people of God is suffering that is inflicted upon Jesus Christ himself. The kindnesses that we do to the people of God is taken as kindnesses to Jesus Christ himself. When Christ's body on earth is served, the head is well pleased in heaven. Now, there's the same thing in marriage and parenting. If you, when you have served my family, you know, I look even in ways that don't directly affect me or help me, but in marriage, when you serve my wife, you're serving me. I'm delighted to see the way my wife is well-treated. I'm delighted to, way, to see the way my children are well-treated. When these things are so close, when there's such a, a tangling up of, of relationships, to serve one is taken as a personal act of service on the other, even when I personally do not benefit individually. I benefit because my family is served. Jesus is saying the same thing is true about his people on earth. But on the other hand, in verses 41 through 46, Jesus declares to those on the left, the goats, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And the reason he gives is that they did not serve the king in the way the righteous had. Now again, they also didn't recognize, when were you in need? When were you in need in these ways and we did not serve you? The difference is, and again Jesus says, what you did not do to the least of these, you did not do to me. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is that the righteous, the sheep on the right, were transformed, had been transformed, so this was unthinking, it was intuitive, to love what the king loves, namely to love the people of the king. But in this case, the goats on the left, their hearts had not been regenerated. The world hates the people of God. The world hates the church. Those who have not been transformed by the gospel do not love what the king loves. They hate us because our deeds are righteous, is what First John says. Thus, these people who continued on despising, thinking little of, uh, giving no attention to the least of these Christ brothers are condemned and cast into eternal punishment. Now, the issue here is not because, like in the one talent servant, they hadn't done enough. It wasn't that they hadn't done enough, it's they hadn't done anything. In all of these opportunities to serve Christ's people, they did not. Again, why hadn't they done anything? Well, again, it's not just because they were supposed to lay up these works. It was because they originally, lying underneath fundamentally that, their hearts had not been transformed. They did not have the right posture. You see, if we reduce this message of this section to a practical preparations, just do more good things, then we're going to miss the underlying fundamental issue, the posture of the heart. It's not about doing specific things, even, even less than Thanksgiving is about eating specific foods, turkey, pumpkin pie, that kind of a thing. Rather, Jesus is presenting the kingdom as a feast, a wedding feast. The joy of the master for those who have been received, uh, entering into the, the kingdom, the inheritance of the kingdom. And Jesus is saying, this is of love and joy and righteousness in Christ. And it has begun by the love and joyful, love toward and joyful fellowship with Christ's people. The sign that someone has been transformed is when they begin to think about other sinners, other sheep for whom Christ died as important and valuable and worthy of service. The question this is, is, has your heart been fundamentally transformed toward Christ, to be sure, but then ultimately also toward his people? And so here our application is this, prepare for Christ's coming by pursuing faithful love toward Christ's people. It's so critical to understand that you are not saved by good works. This passage does not teach that. The scriptures everywhere declare that we are not saved by good works. We are justified by faith apart from works. But then the scriptures go on to say that we are saved, we are justified for good works. That were created and prepared beforehand, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. 
It's not that we must do good deeds to earn salvation, but rather that having been saved, having been pardoned by the blood of Christ, having been transformed in our hearts from the inside out, that the outflow of that is we begin to do good works. Our works are never the basis, the foundation, or the roots of our justification, but they are the outflow, the fruits of our justification. If there are no fruits of good works, that is evidence that the roots are still diseased so that we are still producing no good fruits. It doesn't mean we need to add fruits in order to fix the roots. It means that we need those roots to be changed first and foremost through faith in Jesus Christ and repentance from our sins. And from there, God will begin the work of bearing these kinds of fruits where we serve Christ's people. Thus, the way we gain standing in the kingdom is not to try to do more good things. The problem, as John the Baptist mentioned way earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, is the axe must be laid to the root of the tree of our lives. That root, whatever we are depending upon and living for in this life, must be chopped out to make room for new roots that Christ gives us by faith. That must begin by faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and for righteousness. And then by that faith, Christ begins a transformative work by His Holy Spirit in our hearts to give us a new heart, a soft heart of flesh that bleeds for fellow sheep for whom Christ has died to love those whom King Jesus loves. Because indeed, as we think about our King, we know that the one thing that we know about our King is that He loves His people. The gospel message that is right now being spread by angels through the blast of a trumpet to the four winds. Right now, that gospel is proclaiming first and foremost the love of God that has been poured out for us in Jesus Christ. The love of Christ, our King, tells us that this King of heaven, the eternal Son of God, He emptied Himself of His blessedness, joy, and glory, and majesty, not by getting rid of those things but rather by taking the form of a servant where he veiled those things, where he did not make use of them, where he did not count his, the bliss that he had in the form of God as a thing to be clung to. But instead he became the man of sorrows. Why? Out of the great love for his people, those upon whom he had set his love from before the foundations of the earth had been laid in eternity past where a plan was established where the eternal Son of God would enter into this world and, and suffer in so many ways leading up to the extreme humiliation and suffering at the cross, where this King of heaven traded joy for sorrow, where he traded praise for condemnation, where he traded glory for shame, where he traded bliss for torture, where he traded blessedness for wrath, and he did this out of love for you, his people. Has this gospel message blasted like a trumpet into your heart? Has it penetrated your soul so that the love of God is poured out for you by the Holy Spirit? Is that love filling you up to the overflowing where it begins to spill out in the love of God for His people to train you to love those whom Jesus also loves? Has it prepared you not only in practical, fruitful works, but also in faithful love for His people? If so, how does that spill out? And I want to give you just a couple of ways that you can think of in the church to serve other people. The first one is the fair trade market that's coming up. We see this as a critical aspect of loving the least of these, many of whom do not live here, most of whom, the vast majority of whom do not live here. People who are suffering from various things, some of them from persecution, some of them from human trafficking, in a number of ways they have been in hard times. And we see this as a critical way for our church to take up the mantle of providing practically for their needs by coming to a sale where we invite our friends and, and tell them about the good things that are happening around the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ as, the, as people are being transformed and given new lives through Christ, not just economically, but particularly spiritually. Participate in that. Invite your friends to that. I also want to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up with Beyond Prison. Again, Jesus talks about visiting those in prison. We have partnered with a ministry, Beyond Prison, where we are seeking to minister to those who are families who have loved ones who are incarcerated. 
And we're coming into Christmas, and we've had a couple of events here, but this Christmas one, again, last I heard a week ago, maybe more are, are signed up now, but 30 children were signed up. What an opportunity to come to this event and to minister to these children and to build bridges into these families. We're also going to be bringing in a giving tree, um, a Christmas tree that's going to be filled with the names of real children who are affected by these difficult things. I don't know whether all of these know Jesus, but there are going to be ways to pray for them, potential gifts that you can purchase for them. And I want to ask you to consider doing that, to pray for these children. Pray specifically that your stewardship of the gospel would go to these children, for them to not only have a Christmas gift this December, but to receive the inheritance of the kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. Would you give? Would you donate? Would you volunteer to come serve these families? Right now, there are many opportunities to do these kinds of things when your heart is fundamentally transformed by this faithful love of God in Christ poured out into us by the Holy Spirit, spilling out of our lives to love the least of these Christ's brothers. Pray for the ways in which God might be calling you to serve, to pursue those needs, whether in these formal ways that we've established as a whole church or whether in the private ways in the relationships that God has given you to steward that none of us share. How then are you preparing for the coming of Christ? Remember what Jesus says in the previous passage, Matthew 25, verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Prepare. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that Christ would be glorified in our midst, that you would transform our hearts, that we would be known as a people who love one another, and that that love would not transform other people as they look to see what great people we are, but as they see the greatness of our God who is at work in our midst. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would be powerful, powerful to transform us and to draw your people, the sheep who are not yet brought into a pasture, under a shepherd yet, that you would draw them into your church, not just to become a member of an organization, but through faith in Jesus Christ to renew them from the inside out. We pray that you would do this for the glory of Christ and the good of your people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.